Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be upon you all. Welcome uh, to Muslim Spaces uh, Friday khutbah today. Uh, today, uh, inshallah, uh, this day finds you well. Uh, and we'll be talking today about the wounded healer prophet. Bismillah. Uh, in the past, I usually will do the, the Arabic of the khutbah tul haja, uh, the uh, khutbah that's done uh, as a practice of the Prophet Muhammad uh, before. Uh, the actual sermon itself, uh, but uh, I think it'll be helpful if I start with the English and then do the Arabic, just so everybody follows along. So uh, let's begin. All praise be to Allah, from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one, having no partner, and I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's servant and messenger. Alhamdulillah, na'maduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ufiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyaati amalina. Man yadihi allahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves, and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. O humanity, be mindful of your Creator, who created you from a single soul, and from it created its mate, and through both Allah spread countless men and women. And be mindful of Allah, in whose name you appeal to one another, and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah, and say what is right, Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhal nas utaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidata wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa. Wa attaqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد رب إشرح لي صدري ويصل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. So when I say the term wound, when I describe wound and just you know out of the blue, what do you think of? You know what what kind of imagery comes to mind? What do you feel if we say wound uh, or woundedness or wounds? What 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 feelings come to mind? Maybe pain or discomfort. What what can be the outcome though? When we think of wounds, inevitably, where where do our minds go? Where what what hope do we have with those wounds? Oftentimes, healing is something that we think of, and we sometimes don't think about what does that healing feel like? You know, what does what does that respite feel like? What do we do when we experience some sort of wound, whether physical or emotional, in our own lives? You know, oftentimes if we cut our fingers, if something uh, afflicts us, we'll seek to bandage it up, we'll seek to cover it up, uh, or if we have some kind of emotional wound, if something is done to us where we are uh, feeling really sad or we are kind of knocked out of where what we are used to kind of feeling, if we're feeling very down, uh, we'll try to do our best to cover it up uh, so that no one else will see it. Uh, and we won't really think about reflecting on it. And it seems like an odd thought that when you get a cut or when you get wounded, uh, whether physically or emotionally to sit there and look at it uh, and to just think about uh, you know, how, how it needs to be tended to. You, you usually just act on impulse that I'm hurt, let me just quickly react with something. What we don't notice though, is how we tend our wounds and how we treat our wounds tends to inform how we treat the wounds of others and the care of other people. I oftentimes think about, you know, you, you, you have that image of parents uh, when uh, a, you know, their kid gets cut. I'm recalling from my own experience, I think I fell off a bike and scraped my knee and my mom's first impulse was to run over and make sure, am I okay? But just to see, is there blood? Is there anything? And to bandage it up ASAP. Uh, and, and oftentimes I found that that was the case with my parents as well. When they got wounded, when they had an injury, when they would get cut or whatnot, immediately it would be to go and cover it up. 
Um, what we sometimes think about though, is that when we rush and try to cover up these wounds, try to just rush and uh, address the immediate, uh, the superficial aspect of the wound, we silo ourselves off and we might ignore other factors until that wound is covered. So until the bleeding has stopped, until there's no more red, until I can't see it, we're, we're just going to flush everything out and we're just going to uh, just cover this up and then it'll be okay, then we can look at the next step. But if we sit tenderly, if we think about sitting with this, if we think about seeing what had just happened, processing what is just happening, we can see that there's quite a bit of uh, opportunity to teach something that might be valuable. There's a image that comes to mind. It's from the scene of the movie, The Passion of the Christ, uh, made by Mel Gibson. There's a very powerful scene in there in which uh, Jesus is carrying the cross. Um, he's been condemned to be, uh, to be crucified, so he's carrying the cross um, you know, up, up towards Golgotha, and uh, he stumbles and he falls. And uh, his mother, Mary, is watching and sees this unfold. And as she's watching, uh, she has flashbacks to when he was a child and when he fell down. Um, and you see this, uh, you know, her rushing to him to help him. And it's paralleled with the uh, rushing that she did in childhood to make sure that he's OK. Uh, you, you kind of see that everything else was put aside, but she, you know, she just focuses that's there. But as she picks him up, uh, as she holds him, there's a teaching moment that's there, that she, she, she's there uh, with him. And it, it plays out very beautifully in the movie. But we see that even if we rush to address a wound, it doesn't mean that if we get cut, we're just like, oh, wow, let me think existentially about this. Because after a few minutes, you might start to uh, get a little lightheaded. But to address that wound, but to know that just because you had gotten hit, just because you had been wounded, to wrap it up is not the end of the story, that there's so much more that's there. So we're continuing today on our conversation of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu with respect to images of pastoral care and especially how they help us relate to the Prophet Muhammad and this example, uh, this Uswatun Hasana, that uh, this good model, this perfect example that the Quran lifts up for each and every one of us. Last time we discussed the uh, metaphor of the courageous and the good shepherd. This time we talk about the wounded healer. Uh, and recall that the images that we convey, uh, images in and of themselves convey thousands of words and meaning. They, they are infinite in their meaning, uh, more so than any one black and white text or word could ever do so. And so uh, what we hope to achieve with these images is not just a better understanding of the prophetic role, but because this is such a related role to our very our daily lives and our practices as people of faith, they convey so much more meaning for us. And so this concept of the wounded healer was lifted up and uh, penned by uh, a Dutch Catholic priest whose name was Henry Nouwen. And he gave this rich image and described it as such that the wounded healer, and I, I quote here that the wounded healer is the one who is sitting amongst the poor, binding their wounds one at a time, waiting for the moment when they will be needed. The wounded healer must bind their own wounds carefully in anticipation of the moment when they will be needed. They are called to be the wounded healer, the one who must look after their own wounds, but at the same time be prepared to heal the wounds of others. Essentially what Henry Nouwen is referring to is another image, a, another metaphor of this pastoral care in which a minister or a caregiver, or in this case, the Prophet is uh, another is a uh, person who has been afflicted by life's wounds loneliness, uh, alienation, separation, isolation, uh, or al also physical wounds as well. And uh, with this woundedness, finds within themselves a way to better understand themselves, a way to better connect with their creator, but also a way to heal, a way to heal themselves, as well as a way to heal all those who are wounded around them. The wounded minister and the wounded agent then becomes a healing person, a healing agent. And so their example, the, the example of the wounded healer, the example of someone who takes on these wounds is not just for us to take life's moments for granted as moments that simply happen and now we're, we're either giving up or we just lament and we just, you know, just kind of, you know, go in one polar extreme or another. But these are moments where in addition to 
uh, the negative feelings that we have. In addition to maybe being given space to lament and grieve, we find meaning in our wounds. We find knowledge of ourselves and we find healing for both us and the world around us. The wounded healer as Nauen writes is, as, as it put, and in the case of the Prophet Sallallahu someone that inherently was being wounded throughout his life, but did not use those wounds as a way to just suppress himself, but as a way to be able to change the lives of other people because he was able to connect to them with that woundedness. And so life is difficult. Life is, is something that will wound us all in very different ways. Some of us may be physically wounded. Some of us may be emotionally wounded. Some of us may be wounded in, in a spectrum of different ways, whether it is just by some of those concepts that now and lifted up of loneliness, of isolation, of alienation. And that's something that's been really real, especially in the past year. So when we look, when we see the Prophet Sallallahu as a wounded healer, the objective first and foremost is not to at all minimize or discount our own wounds because oftentimes when we see the Prophet Sallallahu as a model of strength and a model uh, to be followed, we'll sometimes say that, oh, he had it worse or his companions had it worse, his family had it worse, so I, I should just kind of suck it up, like, you know, I should be okay. And that, that really does a disservice to uh, the ministry that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, brought, but also uh, what lessons that Islam has to meet us where we are. If it was just to, hey, look back there, your life is a lot better. Um, what, what benefit would our faith be uh, beyond just something superficial in a sense like that? Um, so now and writes about how uh, a wounded healer is not just someone who gives these little tidbits and says, oh, everything will be better. It'll be good. Things will get better. Um, you know, better days are ahead or, you know, some of the things that you hear when people are in difficulty. Other times people just sugarcoat uh, some of the things to make them feel better. And now and says, no, the wounded healer is not someone who's there to sugarcoat, but someone to be there and to sit with you to be present because they themselves have gone through this, but they are not going to own that space and say, well, look, I went through this. So it's not going to be that hard. They open up a space for others to feel heard, to feel seen, uh, but allow them to have those wounds being healed in a way that is not a very traditional sense. And so when we see these uh, examples, we don't want to minimize or discount our own. We want to find comfort and healing in the Prophet Sallallahu struggles, as well as the struggles of his family and companions. These were men, women, and children of all different ages, people who were foreigners in the land, people who were ethnic minorities, people who are rich, who are poor, all across the spectrum. So if I'm just to take us in, in a silo and say, well, I can't relate to the people of 7th century Arabia uh, just because of our ethnic differences, then we, we kind of end it right there. But if we look at that society for as eclectic as it was, especially during the Prophet's time, we'll see that in more than one way, it mirrors maybe where we are as a society at the moment. We might look a little bit different, might have a, a different language, but the essence is still there. And so when we see the Prophet ﷺ, we see uh, in his life, he exemplified this aspect of woundedness, but also someone who was also a healer. So he was someone that was tremendously wounded throughout his life, not even just after Islam or before Islam, but throughout. But he was someone that was able to find a way to provide healing uh, to his community. And sometimes it was not a direct healing. Like he, he was not, you know, like a direct healer that would go up to somebody and, you know, pull, pull some stuff like you see kind of in, in the gospels where, where Jesus lifts some people out of the dead. He doesn't have that those, those specific uh, examples, but there's other ways of healing that are lifted up. We know that within 10 years of his life, within 10 years of being born, he had been orphaned three times. He had lost his father before he was born. He lost his mother when he was six. He lost his paternal grandfather when he was nine. That uh, not only do we know that he had experienced these losses, but we know that this wasn't just someone who was a black and white individual. When his mother passed away uh, on, on uh, you know, during travel, we know that he was at her grave and he wept as a child. He was he was weeping at her grave because he knew that. But what we see that's very important is 50 years later, he was back at the same spot using that moment as a teaching moment. He still wept on that grave 50 years later, even though he only knew his mom for six years, that, that pain, that attachment was still there. And he used that wound of his as a teaching moment because everybody gathered around him. And he said that prior to this, I had told y'all not to come to graveyards or visit the graves, but you know, I, I, I recognize that you, know, you should come to the, the graveyards and visit the graves because they're a reminder of the hereafter. They're a reminder of the, the mortality of life. And so, 
seen just in that example, in the sense the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam using a very open wound. Uh, it, it wasn't something that was something that had just gone away simply because of time, but we could see that him not having a parental figure in his life, him not having a mom or a dad right when you know he was in the formative years, the fact that he didn't have this created a gaping wound that uh, had some trouble closing even as he was an adult. We know that after his childhood, that when he became a father, he also experienced the loss of not just uh, parents, but he lost, he experienced the loss of his children, which didn't go away because of prophethood. His life did not get any easier when he became a prophet or when he became God's chosen person. In fact, his life became even more difficult than it had, had probably ever been. All but one of his children in his lifetime had passed away. And so when we think about that uh, in our times, we might just think that, you know, he, he experienced uh, the death of a child, but in, in their societal context, in their context, and what's present in many countries today, where the person will have to go and dig the grave themselves. As part of that process, they will be digging that grave. Not just that, they will go into the grave. They will lower that uh, casket or they'll lower the body into the grave. And thinking the Prophet Sassam did this not once, not twice, not three times, but uh, almost five or six times uh, for him his children, and also if we look at uh, extended people who were kind of like the children of the prophet himself. And so thinking about how many times he had to do that in his lifetime, but never the fact that he, he let each of these things um, not just go away in a sense that, oh, hey, uh, look, look at me, I've had to take on all this stuff, so don't bother me with anything else, but also not just discounting it, not saying that, oh, you know, this is a sign of weakness, so I should just brush it aside. The Prophet had this at the forefront, that people knew that when he lost his children, when he would lose uh, someone close to him, he was very expressive of it, and he would, he would show it in his emotions, and through his tears, through these wounds, he would show, uh, he would give teaching lessons to people, because uh, there, there are moments that people would say, well, what, what is happening? Why are you, why are you so expressive? Why are you crying? And he teaches them that this is, this is what mercy is. This is how, this is what mercy is. And so we see the Prophet Sassam using very delicate, very tender events that happen in our lives as a way to teach to his community to soften their hearts. Uh, because if they can't soften their hearts for very real losses in life, then what, what benefit will it be when faith comes into their heart? So he's teaching them a very, a very worthwhile lesson in a way that could probably have not been as worthwhile if he just had gone through certain motions and just said, uh, I, it's, it's a wound, it's very painful for me, I'm never going to talk about it again, let's just put it to the side. He opened up those wounds of himself so that we could enter into a process of healing, so that when we experience the death of a loved one, when we experience the death of a child, we experience the death of our parents, we have someone in not just our faith, but someone that is considered to be for us an excellent model and example that has also gone through that. So not to say that my mom or my dad, uh, may Allah give them a long life, if they had experienced something that, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu had experienced even worse, so I'm not even going to worry about that. No, to enter into that wound, enter into that space that the Prophet Sallallahu has providing, and to find healing in that commonality, in that commonality without having to discount yourself. And so, we see that as well during his prophethood, as I mentioned, he got even more wounded than he had prior to his prophethood, whether it was through emotional ways, spiritual ways, or physical ways. When he received his revelation, when he received his very first revelation, the aftermath of it, he felt that he was probably losing his mind. He said he went to his wife and says, like, I must be going mad. I must be going crazy. This is what happened. And we see the Quran come back and reinforce that, no, you're not crazy, you're not majnoon, you've not lost your mind or you're not possessed. And we see his wife as well comforting him too. But we see revelation responding to the Prophet ﷺ as it does. And so when we see the revelation coming as it is to the Prophet ﷺ as a way of comfort, we start to see the Quran not just as a book that sits there and we have to finish once in our life to just, you know, say we finished it, we got a amin, um, and now we're done with it. But it is a, it is what, what has been described as a shifa. Uh, and it is what the Prophet ﷺ has been described as a shifa, they, a healing, a source of healing. Uh, Qadi Iyad uh, had written a, uh, a biography of the Prophet Sallam, or a, a book on the Prophet Sallam that uh, was called Ashifa, that shows how the Prophet Sallam was a, a healing, a source of healing. And uh, through these difficulties as well, it wasn't just sugar-coated, but through these difficulties, the Prophet Sallam was a healer as well. 
So when the revelation paused, we know that the Prophet ﷺ felt that he had been abandoned or isolated, that he was, again, uh, this wound of separation, this wound of isolation. Um, when he preached to his, his message to his community, he was rejected. He was abused physically and emotionally. You have the incident of Taif where he was wounded uh, physically to where his feet were soaked in blood. Uh, but we also see the emotional wounds when he's sitting after running away from Taif and complains to Allah. He said, you know, Allah, to you, I complain. Who are you going to leave me to? Like, I, I'm all alone. Uh, we see that when he would be praying in front of the Kaaba, uh, that the his enemies would come, his you know the people who are hostile to him would come and uh, really just kind of like uh, disrespect him by pouring entrails of animals on him, by throwing dust in his face to the point to where he would come home and his daughters would see their father disheveled and you know abused like this and and they would start tearing and the Prophet son would cry with them. He wouldn't say like, hey, you know, uh, just stop, go, go back to work, do whatever you're doing this. He said, no, like he would cry with them and he would say that God, God will protect your father. Don't, don't worry. And so teaching them a, a lesson, even in his own woundedness to keep trusting God to, he could have said at any point, like, hey, this place has become uninhabitable. Let's, let's pack up, let's leave, or, hey, I'm never going to go outside. But in that moment of difficulty, he used his wound to teach his, his family, especially to trust in God, even when things get difficult. When others who were socially, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, they would embrace his message. He had to witness their suffering as well. Yet he was unable to help them given his own marginalized state. There's a famous incident, uh, very infamous incident of the family of Yasser, uh, of Sumayya and Yasser, the first two martyrs of Islam, and their son Ammar, that uh, you see they are being heavily persecuted by Abu Jahl, heavily tortured. And all the Prophet ﷺ can do is to come stand by them and say uh, to them, be patient, that paradise is yours. Not, not that paradise is somewhere all the way there. Hey, it, it, things will get better or whatnot. But he said, paradise is yours at the present. That paradise is yours. It awaits you. That, that's, that's what you have. And he, he could only supplicate for them. He couldn't do anything for them at that time. But he was someone who had to see in there because of his, uh, from his uh, psychology, might have been like, you know, I have been causing this. But giving them comfort that be, 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 be patient. Be patient that um, whatever this is you're facing now, know that you've er already earned uh, what, what we're all striving for. When he was in Medina, he was away from persecution, but he still experienced different kinds of wounds. He experienced the, diff uh, the wounds of loneliness. He also experienced the same types of wounds that his fellow, uh, his fellow community members would face. There's the example when, uh, I'll, I'll lift up hunger, for example, that hunger is a very real wound that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions faced, that when they're digging the trench, uh, during the battle of the trench, right, right beforehand, they're digging the trench, and they're all complaining of their hunger, and they're lifting their shirts to show uh, the the stones that they have tied to their to their stomach to, to kind of quell the hunger. Uh, and everybody lifts up showing their stones and they lift up, the Prophet Sallam says, well, you know, he just lifts up his shirt and they see that he has two of these stones, that he wasn't complaining or anything, but he showed that he too was hungry and maybe a little bit more hungry than them, but he was hungry as well. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't lift it up that says that, hey, I'm the prophet of God. I, I, I'm the one who you need to protect. So you guys can go do this stuff. I will just kind of be in the mosque and do my own thing. No, he was on the front lines. He was experiencing that hunger with them so that they knew what it was like to, to be able to strive towards Allah, to be able to strive towards a goal together without having to be that there's any kind of difference in us. So he was setting a very powerful example, despite being the prophet of God. The wounds that uh, he had endured were not just something that were there to fuel a pity party for him or to hum humiliate him or make him withdraw, but they were to also teach the Prophet. We talked about how he was a shepherd in his early life as a child, as like a young adult, young boy, uh, how that informed him shepherding people, how that informed him being a shepherd for a community. Similarly, his wounds that he had endured were not just for people to relate to, but for also for him to teach and how to tending his own needs. When he would receive a cut 
whether literal or metaphorical, how to properly sit with that cut, how to bind it, how to pray over it, how to give its proper attention. And in that same teaching that he would do to himself, being able to do that to everyone else. Uh, and then, you know, he could help heal and tend to the needs of those who were seeking faith or in his community across their different barriers and whatnot. So for the Prophet as we as we look to close out here, for the Prophet the stories of other prophets were sources of comfort. The story of Yusuf alayhi salam, as described in the Quran, the story of Isa alayhi salam, the story of Musa alayhi salam, uh, and even of their mothers, of their family uh, members. The, these were stories of comfort for the Prophet sallam, And for us, the story of the Prophet is a, store, is a source of comfort, especially in these wounded spaces. Uh, the Prophet sallam, we know, experienced the loss of wives, of spouses, of friends uh, and had a general aura of grief that just surrounded this prophethood but it wasn't one that uh, had 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 derailed it completely it was one that was used as an active teaching moment there's a hadith that the prophet said that there is no one who is wounded in the cause of allah and he's referring to a literal wound a, 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 you know referring especially towards battle uh, that and allah knows best of who is wounded in allah's cause but he, that person, will come to uh, will come on the day of judgment with their wounds, looking as they did that they were wounded. The color will be the color of blood, but the smell will be the fragrance of musk. There's a um, a, a saying by Shams Tabrizi, the teacher of Rumi, that Allah has everything. Uh, Allah is missing, does not have one thing that humans do have, and that is brokenness. So when we go to Allah, when we uh, appear to Allah, when we come in our uh, honest states to Allah, we are going to be bearing those wounds, whether literally or metaphorically, we have those wounds that are there. Uh, but depending on how we tend to those wounds, depending on how we uh, see those wounds as, as opportunities for teaching or just opportunities to further cover ourselves and just uh, brush things under the rug, uh, it will determine how those wounds are seen. Uh, and if we see those wounds for us in our life, sorry, yeah, uh, the room here goes in and out with the light. Um, but if the, the room, uh, with, with respect to the color of the wound, if the wound is something that we've endured in, in our life here, it can be a source, not just a benefit for us in the hereafter, but it can also be a source of benefit for the people around us. So the Prophet Sallallahu wounds were a source of healing for him and subsequently, subsequently for us. In the Quran, the, uh, Allah says, uh, that by the glorious morning light and by the night when it is still, your guardian Lord has not forsaken you is not displeased with you. And verily the hereafter will be better for you than the present. And soon your guardian Lord will give you that which you shall be well pleased. And did your guardian Lord not find you an orphan and give you shelter and care? And he found you wandering and gave you guidance, found you lost and gave you guidance. And he found you in need and gave, made you independent. Therefore, don't treat the orphan with harshness, nor repulse the one who is unheard, but the bounty of your Lord proclaim and rehearse. This teaches us that this revelation came to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he was feeling wounded, when he was feeling abandoned, when he was feeling orphaned, when he was feeling all these different ways that Allah's using those wounds as a means for connection, as a means to come to the Prophet ﷺ and to teach the Prophet ﷺ. So from this, we derive that inevitably life is going to wound us. The Quran reminds us in Surah Ankabut that do people think that they say, once they say we believe that they'll be left without being put to the test? We will experience a variety of wounds and loss in our life. We'll uh, see relationships and friendships break and end. Loved ones and things that we hold dear will pass away. Our bodies will experience injury, illness, and disease, and we will experience pain spiritually, emotionally, and physically. But we don't need to trivialize these wounds, or do we need to rush to cover them up? In these wounds, we have crucial lessons for us in how to become our best selves. In these wounds, there is healing. 
and to close in the life and times of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as the family uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions. There was not just ease and comfort and joy, especially after Islam, but there was trial, there was tribulation, there was difficulty and injury. Yet these struggles and these stories are not just a means for us to say that our wounds are not that bad, they had it worse, or our difficulties aren't that hard, they had it worse, but to see them and the lesson that they can teach as sacred. That these are not just afflictions, these are moments of teaching, these are teaching lessons. And so as humans, we are inherently wounded. Our, as Surah Al-Asr says that, uh, that humanity is indeed in loss, humanity is indeed wounded. In our wounds, we can relate to the Prophet ﷺ. In our wounds, we can come to know ourselves. In our wounds, we can learn to be healers of our own wounds as well as those of others. And when we learn more of who we are, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us we know more of who the creation is and we know more of who Allah is. So wounds can be scary, they can be painful, but they can also be openings for us to become even more. May Allah allow us to be able to use our wounds and tribulations as a means of healing and a means of connection to one another and to Allah. O oh, servants of Allah, may Allah be merciful to you. Verily, Allah commands you to act with justice, to confer benefits upon one another, and to do good to others as, uh, as one does to one's kindred, and forbids evil which pertains to yourselves, and evils which affect others, and prohibits unlawful rebellion. He warns you against being unmindful. You remember Allah, he too will remember you. Call Allah and he will make a response to your call. And verily, divine remembrance is the highest virtue. Ibadallah, rahimakumullah, inna allaha ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan, wa itaadhi al-qurban wa yanhaan al-fasha wal munkari wal baghi, ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon, udhkuru allaha yadhkurkum, wad'uhu yastajib lakum, wa ladhkuru allaha yakbar, rabbana taqabbal minna, our Lord, accept from us the service and for our that thou art all hearing and all knowing. Jazakallah khair, brothers and sisters. May we have a blessed Jummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.